In our Data Masterclass series, data leaders share their unique stories. Today, we welcome Nadim von Heidbrand, the CEO of MindFuel. In this episode, we discuss how the best practices of product management from the Silicon Valley can be adapted to manage your portfolio of data, analytics and AI products based on his experiences of implementing over 250 use cases in practice. Let us welcome your host, Alex Borek. Hello, my data friends. Welcome to another great edition of uh, the Data Masterclass podcast. And I'm really, really excited today to have Nadim with me, who is one of the best people to talk about data product management, which is something that is top of mind of many data leaders these days. Nadim, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alex. Hey, good to see you and uh, thanks for having me. So let's get directly started and, you know, tell us a bit about your role um, and, and your company. Uh, mm -hmm. You're a founder, you're a datapreneur. Tell us what the big idea uh, was that you had and about your company. Yeah, happy to do so. Um, so my name is Nadim. Um, I studied business information systems in Munich at the Technical University. And during my studies, in my master's studies, it was really fun. There was a guest lecture. At that time, it was back in the days in 2012, it was the head of BI from Telefonica. I mean, at that time, I had no clue about all of that stuff, but this guest lecture still was like stick to my mind because he presented a use case back in the days and everyone probably today knows about it. It was a use case about churn and what they do to analyze churns and how they can translate this into business And how do, like, man, everyone knows the churn use case, right? It's much more easier. Or it's, it's much more efficient to try to keep as many customers instead of reacquisitioning or to, to retain the customer. And he explained that. And while I was sitting in this lecture, I said, okay, this is something I really like. I enjoy this combination of, of business information and data and, and business impact. So back in the days, I, I always said, okay, now I know what I want to become when I grow When I grow old, I want to work in the data space. So um, after my university, I started in the data science consultancy field. And um, everyone knows for sure here in the audience, probably Alex, Alexander Tam. I uh, met him back in the days. We, or I started to work at Alexander Tam as a data scientist. I, I grew my career there. And in 2019, I've seen a lot of use cases and I've seen a lot of, I had the chance to learn a lot in this space. Also, I did a few churn use cases myself. And however, I realized that I always had to argue for the same questions. Or I always had to answer the same questions to top managers, to leaders in the business industry, which was always kind of, okay, what is really the return of investment on this? Or, or how can you justify the business impact on my P&L uh, or how many use cases do we have to do so that this really becomes a successful initiative? So as we both know, um, we've been both in the car manufacturing industry and um, there were a lot of motivation around data and digitalization and transforming data into real products. However, my answer was always fluffy, <laughs> I have to admit. And in 2019, then I decided, um, okay, I, I have to find out how there is a systematic way to translate data efforts into business impact. And I was wondering how to do this. And this is typically how a startup starts, right? Uh, you start with a problem statement. And uh, my problem statement was how can we create value from data in a measurable and systematic way? And this is why we founded Mindfield then. So, so what is Mindfield about? Yeah. So. The story continues like this, that I, back in my, back in my career, I had a few successful initiatives where we achieved exactly this justification. Right. And so, so one of these, one of these initiatives was with my today's co-founder, uh, Max Cunnings, who used to be back in the days, the product manager of, um, of the Thermomix. So I think, you know, the Thermomix, right? This kitchen at device and Max and myself, we've been friends for a very long time. It's probably and the most popular kitchen device on this planet. You could say. Yeah, exactly. Yes. It uh, has a big we, followership and yeah, a lot exactly. of fans. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, and, and if you look on, on Thermomix within the last decade, I mean, back in the days in 2014, Thermomix was a classical hardware. Oh, of course, we had a lot of automation and, and so on in place already, but it was a classical hardware company, if you want so. And the transformation from this hardware company towards such a digital player and then also now a data-driven player was kind of a journey. And we've been able to truly prove the impact of data on the entire business model. And so without going into details at this stage, I mean, we can discuss it also later, but I, I called Max and said, what have we done differently at Vorwerk? So what have been our success criteria or success factors that we've been able to translate the impact of our data efforts into the business and how we justify this against the stakeholders. And he laughed at me and uh, his, his, his answer was, it's very simple. You in the data world, you have no clue about product management. You always think in projects for you, every, every use case is always a project and it has a fixed kickoff and a fixed end date when the model is ready. But none of you guys has any clue how true product management works. Right. And, and I always, I, and we really got into a fight about that because I, of course, back in the day said, Hey, man, what are you talking about? I built one use case after the other. And then I productized them in a kind of factory approach because I operationalized this model. And this is for me, of course, a product. But he said, No, this is not what product management is all about. And so. After I calmed down again, uh, we sat down and we said, okay, what does this mean? How do we bring product management into the data world? And how can we apply these methodologies and these best practices, uh, which has been very famous already, for example, back in the US. Um, so we did a lot of interviews and research in the US about data product management. So around 2020, it was already a thing in the US. And then we realized, okay, there is something there. We have to figure out how this truly works and we have to explore the space to transform um, product management or to inject product management as a discipline in the data world. Wow. Great story. So when you were at that point, you had already a history of, of implementing a lot of use cases in data science. Tell us a bit about it. How many use cases did you implement? How many industries? What were the types of use cases? I really enjoyed my work and I really loved to work with with all these uh, people out there. So I, I started as a data scientist myself, right? So I worked mainly in the automotive industry in the beginning. Um, then I was a project leader, if you want. So, so I was a project lead. I, I grew into a senior role. Then I became part of the management team at Alexander Tam. And at a certain moment in time, I then was part of the leadership team. And my role transformed from, let's do it, doing the projects towards more steering the projects. And then my focus became more and more data strategy as there was not only the job to deliver the use cases, but to build up the organizational environments. Right. To build everything like, around. Exactly. To be to able to work. Exactly. And to, to make it scalable in a certain degree, because the question was not, okay, how can we develop one, two, three or five use cases, but how can we design an ecosystem where we have kind of an environment where we can continuously produce use cases, if you want so. And I did this in the energy industry. I did this in commerce. I did this in, um, in insurance, in reinsurance. So I would say, yeah, maybe I've seen, I've developed, delivered, steered more than, I don't know, 250, 300 initiatives wow. back in my career. So, and most of um, them were use cases that delivered. Uh, a data science model and exactly so um and it was it was um so my my personal focus was then also a lot in logistics so and because my background back in the days was also operations research so this is where my focus was this is where i then jumped over to data science so also in in, in logistics and um and in yeah manufacturing so these were the use cases all around early warning system early detection fraud detection um, optimization topics um, in the supply chain so this was more or less than my 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 major field besides plus the marketing plus marketing yeah, exactly. and exactly. The stuff yeah that was a big yeah yeah. Well. yeah i was leading for a long time a, a marketing program uh, in the us actually um, for three and a half years, I was working on a global scale, developing um, Next Best Action Initiative. And um, I delivered there more than 20 use cases within this program 
out of which five or six really scaled up into a product and brought return on investment. So this was an entire seven digit initiative, which um, paid off after uh, three and a half years and then scaled out. So yes, um, marketing is also, uh, or all the marketing use cases, sales and marketing cross and upsell use cases are, I'm, I'm quite familiar with, let's say like this, yeah. Wow, that is a very, very impressive track record. So like you said, like over 200, 250 yeah. use cases that you were overseeing in data science. Uh, some of them you implemented yourself. You, you built data strategies around them. Yet at some point you said that's not enough. It's not solving the problem. So tell us about instances where you saw it actually works, where you saw, mm -hmm. you know, besides the Thermomix, where mm -hmm. you saw a pattern that actually worked. Way, which mm -hmm. inspired you, you know, to, to, to dig deeper on that. Because mm -hmm. I, I, you know, and, and what I mean with worked, um, I'm referring to what you said with the struggle to prove value mm -hmm. and communicate value. That, that's a constant struggle because a lot of the impact is indirect that we do as uh, data people. Exactly. So what were maybe the instances where you say, hey, maybe we can learn from that? Um, a super good question. Maybe to understand the, the difference or the 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 impact of, of, of data product management and value management uh, better is if we look how it used to be in the past and, and, and explaining it from a little bit from a from two perspective, we are coming from a project environment where we used to have a kickoff with the business stakeholder, where the business stakeholder handed over the business requirements. Then we try to break down the business requirements and translate it into analytical requirements. If we look a, a little bit at the Chris data mining approach, so this transition from business and business requirements into analytical requirements, then we do the data exploration and then we try to build a prototype and then we try to, to stabilize the prototype and, and, and train it and test it and then try to, to scale it out. And, and this first phase of this process, so the, the requirement engineering, if you want, so classical requirement engineering, this was always a one day workshop. <laughs> so you sat down for one day and then it seemed like that everything has been sorted out. So the entire product design, product, product definition, product design has been done in one workshop. Exactly. Yeah, that this was is, the this, normal thing to do this, for most of these hundreds of use cases. And, and I, I, I remember a time when, when this was exactly. also the case for my work, actually, um, a few years back. I mean, this is this is what we were used to. And I don't want to say that this was wrong at that time, because this was just the best practice how we did it. Because also the lines of businesses, they are busy with their stuff. And whenever you started an initiative, the first question was, how many, how many contribution do you need from my side? Or what is my effort per week I have to contribute? Because I have actually no time, but I want to have, I want to gain this insight. I want to gain even this outcomes. So um, I can I can offer you a one day workshop to sort everything out, but then please go ahead and, and develop the, the solution. And this actually, and, uh, uh, by, by the way, uh, let, let me just say this this all already sort of uncovers one of the biggest um, problems companies have. Like at 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 one hand, company leadership says we want to be a leader in AI in our industry, you know, and we are manufacturer. We want to use AI to be better than other manufacturers. At the same time, they say, hey, as a business unit, I can only allocate one day every three months yeah. to, to do the design. While in tech companies, this is the work of very highly paid people all day, 360 days a year. Uh, so that's really a difference. And, and, and this is exactly what I observed then, that most of the initiatives and use cases which were failing at the end to whatever reason and there are there are 1000 reasons it doesn't necessarily so let, or let's turn it that way the, the most of the use cases never failed due to technical issues <laughs> of course data quality is a topic and we have maybe not enough data and so on and so forth but i've i've been always experienced there are so many t talented people out there and we developed so many great solutions actually so so I was always impressed by, by, by so much talent around me who were able to develop great models out of the existing environments or data which we were provided with. Right. However, the reasons why we were not really scaling out were organizational challenges, cultural challenges, process-related challenges. Maybe there even sometimes exists politics in organizations. Mm. Uh, so uh, without stressing this too much, but there are 1,000 reasons why initiatives don't scale out. Mm. 
And, and if uh, you, I would actually say the politics is the number one reason, by the way. Is, but, yeah. This is this is what you said, no? Uh, but <laughs> but that's whatever. my experience. That's only my experience. You know, everyone has a different experience, but that's my experience. Uh, I, I just want to. I don't just want to be polite. Absolutely. I mean, there are some misalignments in organizations sometimes. However, if you ask your question, if you ask a question, where were these misalignments were coming from? You can always take it back to the very first days of the initiative. Mm. Misalignment in the requirement engineering, unclear mm. expectations. What do we want to deliver? What problem do we want to solve? So all these right. challenges or all the hurdles we have to take at the end of the initiative could mm. always been brought back to the very first days of the use case. So it's not about that the model is not good enough or not performing well enough or that we don't meet the, the barrier or the expected out, output or whatever. It is really in 90% of the cases, you could say, if we would have aligned better in the beginning, <laughs> the, the entire initiative would have been more successful. And, and this is where we are with product management today, because the key of product management is something which we call at MindView the value validation in the first phase. So if you look into best practices of product management, I mean, there's, I mean, most of you or many people know Marty Kagan, right? He's the godfather of product management for digital product management. Um, he's a, a, a very, he, he developed or he designed this kind of continuous discovery, continuous delivery approach or this framework, this model. And if you take these methodologies and look with these methodologies into the data science world, you could say, okay, data exploration and data um, and, and prototyping and all that stuff is more a kind of value validation phase. And, and this is something where you continuously work with business stakeholders, with lines of businesses, and where you constantly try to translate the needs along different dimensions to, to validate and to reduce the risk of the initiative failing at the end. So what we call it, we try to de-risk the innovation phase at the beginning. And this is what product management is highly about. So this is, this is, you're not, you're not too much into then the development piece of it, where, where then the, 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 the value creation happens. This is the second half of it. The delivery part is the value creation, but your main activity happens in the value validation. Right. And the risking means actually to to know as soon as possible what, what doesn't work so you can make decisions faster to bring it faster to a level where it can work. Exactly. So the de-risking phase has different dimensions. One dimension which we as data people are very used to is the feasibility, right? Can we build it technically? Mm -hmm. And and then at Mindfield, we defined another dimension, also technically one, which is called the datability. Because one thing is, can I build it technically? Do I have the right technologies at hand, are the right models and so on and so forth? But the datability defines, do we have enough data? Is the data, is the data, is the data set well balanced? Is it like, do we have enough like uh, variety in the data? All that stuff we need. But you also have two very business-oriented dimensions, which one is called the desirability. Um, so what is the underlying need of my consumer or the user of the system which I'm developing? So if the consumer is the line of business, I need to really understand what is their underlying desire. So the desirability is an own dimension. And the last thing is the viability. So how big might be or can the business impact be of the solution which I'm building. So is the line of business willing, for example, to pay a specific budget or is they, are they willing to pay for a continuous fee over time or what do they need? What makes value for them or what are their willingness to pay not only in, in money, but also in time or in any other currency so that they really like the solution we're building at the end. So we have viability, desirability, dataability and feasibility. And these four dimensions need to be validated along this value validation process. Phase. Right. Let, let me take a step back here, you know, um, uh, because I, I really love, you know, that framework. And I just wanted to tell a little bit of a story. So in when I when I joined the, the Volkswagen group a, a few years back, um, um, this was exactly the problem is that you described. We we had it all over the place. We had lots of and, and you, you probably as much aware as I am. We had lots of. Um, um, great use cases that stayed trapped in the lab, basically. And they had value potential, but they, they didn't have enough value realization. 
And one, and, and that's something that really, I would say that was a moment, a defining moment for myself, because I saw that at scale, how much, how much value potential there is and how little value is actually generated because of all the problems that you described. When I joined uh, in 2018, Volkswagen Financial Services as a global head of data analytics and AI, we actually started from day one applying data product management. Out of that reason, not because we were so smart, it's because of that failure that we saw and we experienced firsthand before. And we thought, how can we do it smarter? How can we get better? And we turned into product management because we thought this is how you need to manage data science artifacts, not as projects, as you said, but as products along a product life cycle from the very beginning to the very end of the life cycle, managing a portfolio of products that is strategically aligned with the corporate strategy. We actually aligned, you know, a, a, um, four pillars with our board um, of uh, directors, with our management board. Uh, we had four pillars, the customer pillar, the vehicle pillar, um, uh, with all the, you know, as, as, as a, as a, a finance, uh, f- you know, a financial institution for cars and, and trucks. Mm-hmm. Of course, you, you focus on the vehicles quite a lot. We had then the OPEX pillar, which was all about uh, back, uh, um, back end um, or back office uh, um, efficiencies. You know, as a financial institution, you have lots of manual process in the back end. And then we also had the pillar of new mobility, which was yeah. all about um, the new business models like predictive par- parking and charging. And we actually identified products in each of these pillars. We had lots of them identified through design thinking, but we took a lot of time and had a face-by-face approach where in the beginning we took a lot of time to actually understand should we even invest in in building that product or not. Um, And that was what you called de-risking, understanding those dimensions that you, you, you mentioned for each of those products together with the business and it took more time but the, and that it also meant that out of 10 pro, strong product ideas only one came into really design into implementation and okay. even from those from from 10 ideas that were designed and, and went into becoming a product only one out of 10 became really a super high value product mm-hmm. so it was really almost like a venture capitalist approach um, and we made sure that the same team is responsible end to end through delivery and through rollout, so we rolled out those AI products across multiple countries um, t- to have it really as a factory. And mm-hmm. I think one of the key things to make this successful was really the role of the, the data product manager. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, Alex, I have to, I have to uh, just to to add a few things to your to your story because I think what you're perfectly explaining, and also for the audience now. I mean, what I've said in the beginning, or at, like explained when I explained data product management um, by its core, there could be someone listening to us and saying, yeah, okay, nice topic, but we have very good product owners and they can do the job and they can cover this kind of de-risking the innovation. And then my answer would be, yes, they can. Um, because we are not talking about the role of data product managers yet. We're talking about the activities which need to be done to de-risk the, the, the failure of one initiative. Right. But what you are explaining now is when you do this at scale or when you scale this out, then you're talking about a portfolio. And then you do portfolio management and then you do this not for one single use case, but you do this for multiple use cases And your job as a product manager is, or as a data leader at the end, is to optimize this entire portfolio because you're getting money or investment. And as you said, like a VC approach, you try to optimize along all these different initiatives. And then you, out of a sudden, you have a full-time job (laughs) or or you have, you, you need an entire department to make sure that all these activities, which we just explained now for one use case, happens for the entire portfolio and everyone out there has a list of use cases you know it's not a problem that we don't have enough use cases everyone did this workshops the design thinking workshops the use case ideation workshops um, i remember in my back in my career we even ran we even executed use cases where we had 1000 use cases at the end yes but the question is how do you optimize this portfolio 
how do you justify all these investments and how do you prioritize these initiatives with the biggest contribution to your business and invest into those? And then, as you said, when you have done this, this properly and when you have executed on these activities the right way, then you go into the delivery, then you go into execution, then you hand it over to your PO or your, to the, your development team who's working cross-functional end-to-end and then you can apply a lot of other methodologies. You can apply SAFE, you can apply Scrum, you can apply DevOps, you can apply, apply ML Ops, you can apply so many different other methodologies in the value creation phase of the house. But in the value validation of the house, there is a lot of, let's say, open field for research. And we at Mindfield, we did more than 10,000 hours of research just in the field of value validation to understand this kind of methodology for portfolio management, for value um, validation along the dimensions, not only for one use case, but how to optimize this then. And so if, I mean, I'm working today with data leaders, they're saying I have to hit this number of value contribution. So I have the, 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 the order from my management to hit, I don't know, 10 million in value contribution or 15 million in value contribution. And I have to prove this. What should I do? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and then it's a different story because they really yeah. are, this is then their objective, right? Yeah. Which sounds very scary. And, and you know, I've been in that situation I, and, and it does sound scary, but at the same time, it's an incredible opportunity. Excellent. Because what it means is that you can now work alongside your CFO, for example, and say, I can deliver that, but what I need from the others in the organization is the following. Exactly. And it, that gives you a much bigger leverage when it comes to implementation of use cases. Um, I think one, one of the experiences that I made was that it, the very sensitive topic is that very often the value is created in, in other departments, business departments, and they need to agree to attribute it to your models or to your products. And that is a slightly political undertaking that is a bit of a negotiation Besides, like, of course, measurement helps if you can actually mm -hmm. show stuff. Mm -hmm. It helps a lot, but it's, it is a very sensitive topic. I, I was about to talk to, to address exactly the same thing, Alex. And it's great, good that you, bring, that you bring it up because now um, you have this kind of, of objective you want to hit. But we know that we have to unlock this value through the adoption of our products in the lines of business. Because as you said, we are, um, we are we creating indirect value. Data typically is a support function. Data is a support function like, I don't know, I always say it's a little bit like legal or HR. I mean, not for, but let's say for traditional economies, for let's say modern or new tech uh, companies, it is core of the core value chain, of course. It's part of the core value chain. But in classical situations, data is a support function. And we are just as good as the lines of businesses adopting our solutions. So now how do we increase adoption and how do we make sure that lines of businesses or business functions are really into all of this? So you have to bridge this or foster this collaboration. And I would say the, the communication in business language, like how can we help them and how does our value contribution improves their lives and their P&Ls and their values? And this is something which is, of course, part then of the viability phase where you have to sit down saying, what is your business opportunity? So in our framework at Mindfield, we talk a lot about business opportunities. So a business is typically not coming around with a use case because they, there are no data people or very, like, don't get me wrong, if they're, of course, they are sometimes especially very quantitative. Um, and for example, if you work with marketing, they, have, um, they are already quite um, data-driven or in terms of figures, but they typically are no data scientists or and they no are data engineers and not yeah, exactly. and not machine learning uh, so, scientists yeah so they can they what they typically do implicitly they don't come around with the use case they come around with a business opportunity and your job as a data leader or a data product manager is to translate this into a use case right this is what we did in the past also so why don't we communicate or why don't we help them to improve also the business opportunity discussing in their language i know this is challenging for us because we as data people we always think we don't have to understand the business or this was in the back in the days we always said okay business is business and we are data and we're then developing just a model 
but helping them, and this is a this is a main crucial piece of a data product manager, helping the business to improve the opportunity for them, and then mapping this opportunity on a data product or on a data on a on a on a data use case, whatever in which stage you are in in your organization. This is a crucial key to to break down barriers and to to break down silos. Because nobody will always contribute to any kind, you know, the business has yeah. 1 million priorities. They also have their goals to hit. We are typically top down organizations. A, a marketing department has their goals to hit and they have no time to support us and our goals, but we, we are the support function, not vice versa. I, I love that. And let, let me, let me share at this point, three value hacks that I just wanted to share with everyone. Yeah. Um, and, and, and those are things that potentially can be combined. So value hack number one that I experienced in data product management is hire product managers out of the business. So this is something that I've done at, at Volkswagen Financial Services quite a lot. You take really the top expert from, from the department you want to, to innovate with uh, and, and bring them on to your team. Uh, and then they speak the language, they understand the value, they can calculate business cases. They know the people and magic will happen and unfold. And also, um, like nobody can, can fool you, um, you know, because, because you have a, an expert for that topic on your team. That's value hack number one. Number two, um, I, I think it's what I see in tech companies is simply put all the entire product team into the business unit. Then mm -hmm. you don't have that alignment problem anymore. Just put the, the product manager, the data engineers and ML people and analysts as a product, full cross-function product team to do churn, to do um, logistics or optimization directly into the business unit. And then there's no problem with the business case because the business leader will acknowledge that business case is within their unit. You don't have that attribution problem anymore. Now then let me just briefly comment to one and two. Number one, make sure that you align with your co-manager that uh, when, you, when you hire people out of their team, uh, this is uh, just one heck of a heck. And um, to the second point, uh, this is, of course, Alex, this is, the, this is the most advanced way, right, to fully decentralize from a centralized approach into a decentralized approach, pushing all of the people into the business function. This takes us then along into a data mesh concept on an organizational level. And um, this is what typically happens in, in state-of-the-art or top-class um, product companies. If you look into Silicon Valley, this is exactly how they behave. However it really depends on your business model if this works out. So uh, I, I'm not sure if I would, I would recommend this to a classical insurance company from day one um, because it truly it's has... It's the culture. Uh, it's the culture, yeah. the organization that you have at the moment. Culture, maturity, your, right. your, your, your organization is set up per se. Um, I've been very successful lately in building very efficient hub and spoke models. So don't get me wrong. Uh, I know data mesh is a huge topic. It's a huge trend. And I, I, I mean, we're running a community ourselves, the data preneurs club, where we are, where we are having a lot of discussions around uh, data mesh as well. However, I think it really the operational model or the operating model really has to fit your organizational style. Yeah. And, and, and then for example, if you are in a classical manufacturing company, yeah. The hub and spoke model might be the perfect fit for you or in a bank. Mm -hmm. And then you just have to make sure that the interface management between product management on data side and the business function is just very well aligned. So I've seen reinsurance companies, not only in Munich, but all over the world, uh, where they have this alignment, where this works out really well and mm -hmm. where the people really working on a daily basis uh, super well and creating value. So I, I couldn't agree with, more with you. I think it is a journey. Absolutely. And, and I think you cannot transform, you know, you, you shouldn't transform, try to transform an entire organization during one day. You know, you have to take it step by step and think what is the right next setup that yeah. creates more value. And especially not for the sake of something. So, uh, so I've been in several discussions lately where we said, okay, we want to do data mesh now. And not only on a technical level, but also on an organizational level, because you know, organization enables technology, technology enables organizations. So you have to make sure that the organization follows then the structure of your, of your data um, architecture or vice versa. And I had to discuss once again, if data mesh is really <laughs> the right, the right setup for the stage of which the organization is in at the moment. And 
regardless if you want to call it now data mesh or federated approach or hybrid approach or whatever we want to call it, I think every organization has always need to make sure that they have a proper data product strategy, which is needs to be, as you said, aligned with your business strategy. So what are the business goals or what are the business light motives we having or the business even objectives? Then we have to make sure that my product portfolio, which we are setting up, which we are designing is fitting to this. And then we have the right operating model with regards to our entire business logic. This fits to deliver this business strategy, uh, this, this data product strategy. And this is most of the cases still a kind of hub and spoke or decentralized hub and spoke. You know, I call it hub of hub and spoke or um, something like a, a, a yeah, kind of mixture between fully decentralized and central. And, you know, how do you, I think one, one of the trick questions is how do you translate a product strategy into a product portfolio? And mm. maybe you could also explain what do you see part of the strategy and what do you see part of the portfolio you know, and, mm -hmm. and where do, do these two meet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the strategy to execution breakdown is, a, um, is a own chapter in, in, in our framework because it is, it's so that all, all he also here, we didn't reinvent the wheel at mind you. We looked into best practices out in the industry and you can learn a lot from classical, let's call it scaled frameworks, where you always have this fact where you have a strategy layer and you have to break it down into execution through portfolio management. So in, in our data context, of course, we have to make sure that our data strategy, now really the toppest layer of our strategy. So for example, what do we want to achieve with AI? How do we deal with large language models? How do we want to deal with classical BI or with dashboarding in general? So on a very strategic layer, you need to answer a few why questions and a few, let's what this is what we call light motives. So um, strategic directives, if you want. So what you typically then do, you break these strategic directives into objectives. So a lot of organizations today use OKRs as a methodology. There is a North Star methodology. There are so many different methodologies to make sure that you're breaking down these strategic directives into executionable objectives. OKRs are very good for that because with the key results, you're coming into a methodology where you already think about how can I measure this objective later on. Then the next step is you have to build up your data product portfolio. And for this data product portfolio, you have to discuss the data product categories you want to address. Because the, 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 my best question in my talks or also in my communities is always, what is your definition of a data product? Mm. There are so many different definitions out there still yet because we have no standards. If you have read the book of Samak, then you say data as a product is a data product. If you talk to a data leader, they typically say, yeah, I have a lot of analytical use cases and my use case is a data product. So on a top layer strategy level, you have to define what type of data products do I want to actually build? Do I talk about data assets, like data, data as a sets. product, data mm -hmm. sets? Do I talk about models, machine learning models, whatever? Do I talk about dashboards? Do I talk about even digital products where, where AI is integrated? So there are different let's call it things you have to sort out and the last step of your of your strategy layer is you have to de discuss your target picture design so target picture design means the target picture of your operating model how do you want to set up the teams which roles do i need what is my architecture setup which capabilities do i need to need to build up and how is the execution process looks like so as i said value validation value creation is typically the two spaces you then start to design out And for this, you build a target picture. Mm -hmm. When you have these elements all done, so business link, objectives, data product categorization and strategy, and then the target picture design, then you typically start to identify your use cases or your product ideas, or you map your existing products into your portfolio along the categories. Mm -hmm. And then a hack happens. You, you try to map your products against your objectives from the OKRs. Right. Because and filter you, and prioritize based on that. And exactly. Because then you, you, you have to make sure that the initiatives you are picking for your, I don't know, six or 12 months, um, for your 12 month roadmap now are mapping into the objectives you have set up, which are coming from the business yeah. strategy, right? And, and this can is the, be measured in terms of the results and the metrics you set forward in terms of the OKRs. 
Exactly. So you map your initiatives on the objectives. And second step is you do your classical product man or portfolio management, right? As we discussed along the four dimensions, you make sure that the KPIs are mapping because right. you still have the business opportunities from the business. And you have to make sure that these map the goals of the business as well. So your initiative has actually then two links. One link is to talk to your OKRs and to the business opportunity and what they want to achieve. And if you can sort that out in the right way, then the, 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 the probability that this initiative has business alignment and contribution from the business maps into your own department strategy and create success at the end with regards to politics and everything we discussed, the reasons why they fail, uh, this is heavily de-risked. And all my initiatives within the last three years where we're following this approach from strategy to execution, um, we've been really, we, we, we really saw, observed a lot of um, positive cases, I would say, where we even break through the wall uh, or break through the roof and, um, and, and turn break even or really created new business models and new revenue streams for these companies. So, so you spent like uh, 10,000 hours of research into, into the question, how does data create value? How do these use cases create value? Um, what, what would be your hack that you would, or your secrets that you could share with the audience here, you know, with regards to value, determine, you know, determining the value, communicating the value, measuring the mm -hmm. value of data products? Yeah, so value measurement or value management is a very um, it's a very complex and complex field still also for us yes. uh, because it is is so difficult to generalize it. True. You know, you know True. it is it is when I see a case or when I see a product, mm -hmm. I have a quite good understanding of how we want to do value management. But it's yeah. very difficult to generalize it to say, okay, this is now your approach for value management and just do it. But my hack would be um, depends on the majority of the product. So let's just, let's assume the product is a complete new idea. So we we all believe this is the amazing idea. This is a great idea. The business line is super super hyped. They want to do it. It fully meets your business strategy goal and whatever, and it, it supports the transformation of the organization. Blah 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 blah. So it's a very promising business opportunity. Then you should start right from day one with typical um, hypothesis based uh, business casing. So classical business casing, lean business casing, where you say, okay, these are the different hypotheses. This is what we try to validate because we are in the value validation phase. And this, these are, I don't know, the, the five or six, seven, eight assumptions we're taking. But you have to write down these assumptions. Sit down, write them down. And with, with quantitative, basically, exactly. measures, like your assumptions, this is how I change a certain metric, basically. Exactly. And, and then you run the first iteration of value creation. For example, yeah. you do a low fidelity prototype. Right. Or you try, and then you have the first value management yeah. review phase. Do you see the needle moving at all or not? Like and, and you see which of the assumptions you set up are still valid or did an assumption break. So, and if an assumption broke, yeah. you have to discuss this very honestly with the rest of the team and the business stakeholders. Can we still hold up to this initiative if, I don't know, two out of eight assumptions broke down? Yeah. But it typically can mean either your, your idea doesn't work, but maybe also your design is crap. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but, I mean, we, we haven't discussed the reasons yet. We just have to discuss, okay, do we want There's to continue? There's a problem. There's a problem, exactly. And why now listeners to, who, who listen to this podcast can say, okay, Nadim, so this is a low-brainer again. Why are you just explaining me how business casing is working? Yeah, because in the beginning of an initiative, I don't have proper outputs to measure, right? If I'm building a model on a test set, which has maybe, I don't know, 5,000 observations, how do I want to generalize from there if the entire business case will work out? So what I have to do is I have to break it down into assumptions and do a classical assumption-based approach for value measurement until I can truly bring this into a test environment. You know, in the testing environment, we all are, I mean, there are much better experts out there than I am. And there are so many testing methodologies, A-B testing and, and measurement and output mapping on, on, I don't know, confusion matrices and whatever. So there are so many, so many options to measure then the impact, but it's very tricky when you are in the very beginning of your, of your initiative. And what you we try to, to work do with assumptions in the beginning and 
and and you have to create a kind of logical approach of base with hypotheses that build on top of each other and 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 find also any early evidence you know that you can you know maybe by having analogies you know looking at something mm -hmm. that worked in a different environment maybe and so on mm -hmm. And stay pragmatic with this. So I think, uh, I mean, this sounds all complex and this sounds like a lot of work. And mm. I don't say run a three month business case uh, project now on, on each use case. I just say, be very pragmatic, write down the hypothesis or the assumptions mm. you're having, run your first iteration of value creation and then find out if the assumptions are still valid. Because this is where a lot of people are, are looking away from my experience. They're saying, yeah, it's such a great idea. Let's do it. And uh, so this is one hack I would definitely recommend um, in, in terms of viability to do the assumption-based planning. I, I fully agree. And, and you know, one, one underlying reason is, of course, fear of failure. You know, all of us have fear of failure. And in particular, when you love your use case, you don't want it, you know, to end. And you don't want to be perceived as a failure as well. So, so a lot of people just continue, continue, continue. And that's very typical and very human. But at the same time, it, it sort of robs you of the opportunity to work on something truly great. So I think navigating here is really important. Yeah, and this is the reason why we're running this in a portfolio approach, right? Uh, and not only in a single approach. I mean, we once I had a conversation about this number, 90% of all data science use cases fail, you know? And and I've been asked in, a, in, a, in an event if data product management will truly reduce that number. You know, Gardner published this uh, a few years ago saying 90% of all data science initiatives fail and so on and so forth. And I said, I don't think that data product management really reduces the 90%, but we know it faster. So we, we, we know it faster because we have a structured portfolio approach and it, it, it lies in the nature, in the nature of, of data science that use cases just fail. You just have to be fast and you have to identify this as soon as possible and set your money on the right horses. Yeah. This well, is... and at the end, it's, it's about, you know, these, these little percentages here and there, when you have a large portfolio and a lot of investment, that makes a big difference. Yes. Maybe one last thought on this, Alex, because I think this is super important, maybe also to people who are not um, been experienced with a hundred people data organization. Because one limited factor when it comes to portfolio management is also the number of resources, right? So if you only have five people in your team, the question could be, yeah, how should I run like uh, portfolio management if I can only pick two or three use cases anyway? And how does this then work out? And my experience here is, um, so I've been also working with very small data organizations, like up to five or 10 people. And nevertheless, building up a first portfolio approach, which is very lean, very simple, but making sure that portfolio management or product management and PO work or the product ownership and product management are two different activities, helps a lot to pick from your use case library, if you want. So they typically have use case libraries and um, to prioritize the right use cases. So value-driven prioritization is also a big part of portfolio management And it's super crucial if you have limited resources, either if it is budget or if it is people. I think it's even more important in such situation, you have to manage your portfolio extremely well because you Absolutely. have a few shots. You have to de-risk by having, the, if you have only two or three, you need to put them into different places. They should not be clut cluttered too much um, to de-risk it. Yeah, because also we at Vorwerk sometimes, um, we, we were pleased because at a certain time or in a certain um Majority, we had a lot of resources, you know, right. in any kind. And then you, if you have resources, failure is easier to accept, you know, yes. yeah. because you still have, I don't know, 10 use cases up and running. And if two yes. fail, yeah, well, so what if the other eight create the business impact, right. then it's fine. But it is really a, a tricky game if you have limited resources. Yeah. And then portfolio management and product management is, from my point of view, even more important. And that allows you to grow because once you, you have a breakthrough, usually you get more resources. Yeah, and, and exactly. It, it, exactly. This is the key to grow. And with the success, you can justify, you know what, I delivered now 1 million added value to your business. If you give me double times the resources, either in budget or in headcounts, then I can do more cases. And so this is how the, the growth works. Now, I just want to emphasize the audience. It, it seems a little bit counterintuitive to to bring product management 
in right from the beginning because you could say, yeah, I need my resources in the delivery. <laughs> and I, if I only have three headcounts, um, why should I now hire a product manager? I agree, I wouldn't hire a product manager, but me as a data leader, I have to understand that I have to take the product management activities okay, yeah. then. Yeah. So yeah. then I have the responsibility of product management and I have to bring it in. I can share one last story from Silicon Valley. When we started, when we started MindFuel in 2020, we did all our research in Silicon Valley. So we talked to product managers at Dropbox. We talked to product management and uh, product managers at Miro who, who were in this field. And they always said, my job now as a, as a product manager in data is we are a very small team, but to ensure the business success of our business functions, so that we can grow the team and establish this role as a full potential FTE. Because at that time, there were, there were POs, they were leading the development team, or they were kind of managers working in the data unit as, yeah, you know, to the CDO or whatever, like uh, executive assistants to the CDO. And so as of today, when we are running our, our interview series in the US, data product management has become a full discipline and uh, the investment of a data product manager or the investments into product management pay off in less than six months. In less than six months. That's exactly the experience that I made at Foxfang Financial Services. I made the same experience at Zalando. I made the same experience working with other companies that I'm, I'm helping sometimes. Um, and, and I can tell you it pays off directly, immediately. And actually, it's, I think it's, it's the biggest risk that you can have uh, and not that you, know, you will guarantee, I will guarantee you that you have a 90% percent sort of uh, probability of failure if you don't have data product management from the very beginning. Um, so you can, you can, you can save y yourself that failure, you know, and, and start right from the, from, from the beginning here. Maybe, maybe, you know, to, to, to start closing this up, um, you know, when you look at product delivery, mm -hmm. What does change, you know, is that really the approach that I, I remember at Volkswagen Financial Services, we celebrated when we actually killed a product yeah. during delivery. We said this is a celebration. We called it Dexit, you know, like Brexit, mm -hmm. but the data exit. That was a very important part of our culture because we said we don't want to have zombies in our portfolio, which led us to have a super healthy, very high impactful portfolio. And our people were working on the right things. Is that the biggest difference in the delivery? Uh, do you see yeah. any other, other uh, big things? No, this is uh, so, Alex, it's super good that you mentioned this um, uh, because like one big job of product management in general is killing things that don't work or even build something out of product. So if you talk to classical product managers and digital product management, you know, they say decommissioning <laughs> So decommissioning features or taking out features is one of the most important things because otherwise you build and build and build and build and build and you have a lot of features in your ecosystem, in your system, in your technology, which needs maintenance, which needs operations. So you always have to make sure that you, that you keep your product healthy and you can, you can adapt this mindset exactly to your data world as well. So when a use case is not working, We have to kill it as soon as possible. And even if we already started or the pivot, delivery or do something, or, okay, exactly. Or, or pivot or whatever, but this kind of, um, also mentality mindset, this product mindset, as we yes. say that might feel, um, also to, to take this all the way down to the delivery of the product. Yeah. And measuring throughout, you know, not, don't fly yes. blind basically. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So this is, this is super crucial. And the second thing I've observed when it comes to the delivery part of the house. So I start in a scaled organization because I can explain it easier in a scaled data organization. In a scaled data organization, let's say, I don't know, 100 people, just as an example, random number, you typically have a data product manager full-time full, full -time equivalent, right? This is one person who's doing this. And this data product manager is then serving product owners with different use cases, which they have validated, right? So there is something like an interface between the product manager and the product owner, same as in the digital Or world. other product managers, but that, that, that basically take care of normal the, software products, the, basically. Exactly. The most important thing is that we have two people. Yeah. So, yeah. and yeah. these two people have to be super good aligned and they have a, they need to work very closely together. And this is crucial for the success of the delivery. Yeah. 
because the PO is the one who, who is responsible for the backlog, for the execution, steering out the teams and so on and so forth. So this is super critical. Now taking this all down to a smaller organization, let's say a data unit with 10 people, where we typically don't have a dedicated person for product management, but activities are covered. We observe very often that the product owner is covering the product management activities. So the activities are combined in one person. Right. Then we have to make sure that the product owner has enough space for product management. That. Yeah, exactly. For product management activities. For and data not, product management in particular, yeah. to understand the machine learning background or the data background. Analytics. Exactly. So because otherwise the delivery is heavily suffering yes. from, from this, from this, um, let's say overwhelmed product owner who needs to understand on the one hand side, the business needs and the business desires at the same time, prioritize the backlogs, making sure that everyone has worked. So these people typically become bottlenecks. So always keep an eye on your product owners if they have to cover both worlds and make sure that these people have enough space and a good guidance, maybe even a good scrum master on their side um, who can help them in the execution and the appliance of different methodologies for the execution himself. So this is something I think. Really good. Um, you know, and, and, and this reminds me of, of the value hack number three, you know, which, which is really what, what I found really uh, working well is in, despite, in, instead of giving a product to a product manager, Give an OKR a goal, to, you know, like a strategic goal to your product manager. And that product manager will, will manage that part of the portfolio. Like, like in the example at Foxbank Financial Services, where I had somebody taking care of the customer domain or of the vehicle domain. And then thinking about which kind of products do I want to invest with the resources I have in mm -hmm. to be most successful. And this way you are much more entrepreneurial. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and, and people are much more willing to kill a product because they can work on something else that creates more value. Alex, I can, I can fully agree with this and let me explain it. Why I can even explain what I've seen and observed now in my career within the last few years in product and data product management is if you give an OKR to a product manager, then the product manager owns the accountability for the product. Right. But he's not account. He's not necessarily needs to own the accountability for the people working in the product. So what happens is a product manager steers the product organization from left to right, cross-functional among the different uh, functionalities of the product instead of top-down. And he's just paying in the outcome of the results from the product into the OKR. Right. So, and this, this creates a lot of synergies and effects of cross-functional collaboration in teams. Now we're coming a lot to this agile, um, to the agile space, but product managers are, they are leading a product. They are not yeah. leading necessarily an organization. Yeah. And they and have they that are, full focus on leading that product and And, and leading these cross-functional teams, but as you said, not disciplinary, but really not, more from a, from exactly. a goal perspective. Yeah, exactly. Not, nece perspective. exactly. Not, not necessarily disciplinary. I mean, it doesn't fail if, it, if it's also, I mean, this is a different structure then, but in a Spotify approach or a cross-functional approach, it makes super sense to steer the organization from left to right, cross-functional. This is what we call something we call a value area at MindFist, or we define a value area. And this value area, this gets an OKR, and this is coming from the top management or from your data product strategy, is handed over to a product manager, and then he executes on it. And this is this unlocks massive speed. Massive value, massive value cool. and speed. And I, I can tell everyone that I've been operating product data product, my data product teams like that for the last five years in very different environments. So, and I, I, I throughout the time, we could deliver enormous value and get lots of stakeholder buy-in because of that uh, and deliver really good products. So, so it really works. It's something that is proven in practice. So, for, so, so you know, in companies like Zalando, um, um, maybe also Delivery Hero, Spotify, you have data product managers already embedded. Product management is part of our culture. What would you recommend for to data leaders who are starting off on their journey, you know, to mm. in, create product, um, habits, culture, teams? I can now reflect to a lot of projects of ours. So it really depends on the maturity. But usually uh, my suggestion is 
number one, start to learn about product mindset. Um, I think this is a great foundation. It doesn't take, it, it does not take month. It just like get familiar with, with what means actually to run products and generate an understanding about a product mindset. But then the very next step very quickly is uh, look into your operating model and um, implement or think about an operating model design where you where you separate between um, value validation and value creation or discovery and delivery whatever you want to call it and and think about how you can build up your portfolio management right. and and this is something which when we started with this in our strategy projects implementing a data product um, operating model design we relieved a lot of pains right from day one because of clarity of responsibility. <laughs> oh, and uh, that's the, so important. That is the, so the, important. So it's sometimes unclear who is actually responsible for what. And in, if you if you rework your operating model just slightly and, and separating these activities out and building up this operating model between value creation and value validation, this helps a lot. Amazing. This is step one. Oh, that was a long, long session on data product management. And I think we covered so much uh, in that session, you know, from, from really product strategy and why it's important, so important from day one to apply product management to your data strategy work as soon as possible and how to translate that into a tangible portfolio, how to deliver, how to, to, to test stuff before you design it, how, how to de-risk it before you start designing, how to pick really the, one, the winning horses and then to, to you know, and to, to sometimes, you know, to, uh, put your uh, horse into retirement if, if that horse is not, <laughs> turns out not to be the right one and how to get started as a company uh, uh, when you want to, uh, when you really want to start and you should implementing data product management uh, um, from tomorrow onwards. Wonderful. And, you know, uh, we talked about uh, the, all these things with, with Nadim from Heidebrand from, uh, as the CEO of MindFuel. And, you know, Nadim, you've been, you will also be visiting the Data Masterclass Europe 2023 and will be one of our master coaches. What will you, uh, you know, what will your session be about? Yeah, so I'm, I'm really looking forward um, to exchange on data product management. So, and especially we focus on value management. So we try to discuss a lot of how can we increase the impact from data. Um, I mean, you said it very nicely and challenging at the same time. We want to create up to 10x more impact from our data, from our data products. And um, so I'm really looking forward uh, to this conversation and yeah, discuss tips, tricks, best practices, what is needed, what we have seen in the past, uh, what has worked out, where did we fail. So um, I will share everything I've learned and everything we researched within the last three years, which is hopefully then enough for filling up the workshop, but I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we probably can cover days. <laughs> Wonderful. Nadim, thank you so much for being on the Data Masterclass podcast. Um, and we look so much forward to, to hearing you live on stage in Berlin on the 21st of June uh, at the Data Masterclass Europe. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you, Alex, for having me. It was good fun. See you soon, yeah? Best. Boric Data Masterclass, where great data journeys begin.